Thank you, everyone. Uh, we've got a good number of people already here, and the numbers getting uh, growing as we go. Um, have been really pleasantly surprised at the interest uh, a financial literacy webinar during Financial Literacy Month um, has generated, um, albeit with uh, perhaps an intriguing title. I um, uh, want to uh, welcome uh, guests here to start off with. Uh, joining me on the panel today uh, are Rafe Mazur from Innovations for Poverty Action, Jai Shri Venkatesan from the Center for Financial Inclusion, and Lauren Willis from Loyola Law School. You can see their full details and links to their bios on a post on uh, financialaccess.org about this. We won't go through the full details. Um, if you don't know them, trust me to say, they're really great people to be here for this conversation. I'll also note that this is a part of the Household Financial Security Insight Community uh, with the collaboration and support of the MasterCard Impact Fund. And the goal of the Insight Community is to bring together practitioners, researchers, and policymakers to advance the state of knowledge and practice in household financial security. And Honestly, financial literacy is a pretty big topic in household financial security, and then we're going to spend some time thinking about that and talking about that today. Um, if you're not a subscriber to The Five, which, you know, uh, why would you be given that we have taken a hiatus for quite a bit of time working on other projects, um, but would love to have you subscribe there so we can keep uh, you up to date with Five Lives as they come. You can also visit our blog for follow-ups to this webinar, a link to the recordings, uh, and some recommended readings that we'll be uh, talking about today. Um, and one of the reasons I mentioned the hiatus is that we've been very focused on something called the Small Firm Diaries Project, which is a uh, global project to understand the financial lives of small firms in seven countries um, that we're pretty excited about and starting to publish some early findings from. So uh, on that note, um, I'm going to stop sharing and bring everybody here together. Uh, welcome to Lauren, Jayashree, and Rafe. Um, let me start off by sort of setting the stage. April is Financial Literacy Month, um, in the United States at least. Uh, this is an outcome of a joint resolution of Congress uh, back in 2004, um, which originally did as Youth Literacy Day, which apparently came into existence as part of a high school financial program. I'm not sure really all the connections between those, but along the way, an organization called the National Endowment for Financial Education uh, encouraged a bunch of people that there was a financial literacy crisis in the United States and that we needed to take urgent action. And since then, that's been taken up by people sort of trying to study this, writing uh, research about it, surveying people about financial knowledge and financial practices and gone global. And so you hear these days, as I'm sure many of you have heard before, statistics like uh, only 57% of US adults are financially literate. Um, uh, only 47% of adults living in low-income households are financially literate. Um, only one third of adults could answer at least four or five financial literacy questions on fundamental concepts such as mortgages, interest rates, inflation, and risk. And worldwide, only one in three adults are financially literate. Not only is financial literacy illiteracy widespread, but there are big variations among countries and groups. Women, the poor, and lower educated respondents are more likely to suffer gaps in financial knowledge. And so uh, before we dive into it, I thought the best way to start was to poll all of our participants who clearly care a lot about financial literacy um, on a pretty standard financial literacy question. So I've just launched this. Um, hopefully, I've never done this before on a webinar, but hopefully you can see the poll. And uh, if everybody would take just a, a quick second to answer this and see where we end up. You guys are very compliant. Um, thanks for quickly so quickly leaping into that. I appreciate that. Um, I'm wondering if, uh, since I haven't done this before, can participants see this? No, uh, only I can see the answers. Okay. So um, 
I'll tell you that 75% uh, of you have nominally passed the test by answering more than $110. However, you're all wrong. And with apologies to Matt Levine, I'm going to borrow that the answer to this question is only correctly given by 5% of people, which is you will have less than $110. You'll have less than $110 because anybody paying 5% interest on a savings account now is a scam and has stolen all of your money. You have $0. So um, that may give you a, a bit of insight into some of the approach we're gonna be taking today, but to really ground us here, um, because uh, there is some uniformity, I think, of perspective from the people we have on the panel today. Um, I'm going to ask each of our panelists to make their best case for financial literacy education. I've asked them to do that in good faith, but uh, we're going to start with Lauren. Lauren, if you were to make an argument for why we should invest in improving financial literacy, what would it be? Well, government cannot be there all the time to protect people. Right. So people need to know how to protect themselves. Um, I think that's one of the more compelling arguments. Um, and, you know, in addition, uh, there's the argument that the alternative of financial regulation would re restrict people's choices. And of course, people have, uh, you know, different decisions that will be optimal for them, depending on their financial situation and their values. You know, for some people, taking out an interest only loan is uh, risky, but for others, it could get them into home ownership more quickly and it could end up being successful. Um, you know, uh, people have different values. For some people, it's worth taking some risk uh, to borrow for an important cultural celebration, um, you know, Christmas, for example, uh, for some people, but uh, for other people, it's not an optimal choice. Uh, and if the government were to be regulating and it would restrict people's choices, people could not make sort of the optimal choices for their own situation. So I'd say those are the two strongest arguments, I think. Thanks, Lauren. Jayshree, what would you say are the best arguments for investing in financial literacy? I think it's the, I mean, I agree with Lauren. I mean, I agree that people need to be capable of, you know, they need to have the confidence to make their own decisions. But the human capital argument, which is, um, if you think of education in general, you need people to have the confidence and the freedom to live a better life. And so if, if you draw an analogy with financial education, they need to be able to navigate and uh, feel confident enough to make certain decisions. So that's the argument. Rafe? Um, I think the most compelling argument for financial literacy is some of the research around the concept of financial capability which I know some people are encouraging as um, sort of an alternative or an improvement on financial literacy. And that's really about um, developing things like, like positive habit formation and how you manage your finances and things like that. And that actually does have rigorous experiments, which have shown, you know, when administered, particularly when administered by a financial service provider, not a government, which I'll talk about later, it, um, it can improve things like savings or managing of business records. So that's that's maybe the um, the best argument I would say um, is that the, there's some new approaches that maybe are less the kind of teaching eight-year-olds compounding interests that are showing some effect. Mm -hmm. So Lauren, let me turn back to you then because uh, Lauren has written a fabulous paper uh, that's a part of the Routledge Handbook of Financial Literacy. Um, I recommend not necessarily buying that book because it's $200 and maybe would be an indicator of low financial literacy if you're willing to pay $200 for this book. Um, but you can find it on Lauren's website and there's a link to it on the, uh, um, uh, on the blog post. But Lauren, walk us through what are the counter arguments to those best arguments for financial literacy? How would you sort of argue that in fact those arguments are, aren't sufficient to justify the investment that we see in financial literacy? Um, well, first, there's no credible evidence that these financial education programs actually give people the tools that they need to protect themselves or to make optimal choices for their own situation and values. Um, you know, most of the studies of these programs are bunk. There's a lot of just self-reports. Um, you know, they answer hypothetical questions or attitude questions. There's no controls, um, et cetera. 
Um, there are rigorous studies, uh, a small number of, of more rigorous studies. They tend to show that it increases people's confidence without a commensurate increase in skills, which is a recipe for disaster. Um, Meta-analyses meta don't show much of an effect. Um, you know, this argument that, well, it gives people more freedom in making decisions. I mean, uh, I don't feel more free if I have to figure out whether my toaster is going to explode or whether my mortgage is going to explode myself. I feel more free when I can spend my time doing other things than being um, a product expert or a fi financial expert, right? Um, in addition, you know, it, we can't really expect the, the literacy aspect, which may be a little different than the habit formation aspect, uh, to work just because the gulf is so wide. Um, I mean, we don't teach people basic math. People can't calculate 20% tip. Um, in addition, the market changes so quickly that things that we teach people, even habits, uh, often end up being outdated. Um, if regulators can't keep up with the speed of financial uh, innovation, we can't expect educators to, and we certainly can't expect their students to. Um, and you know, industry spends so much more than we are ever going to spend on this, that they're going to run circles and marketing and sales practices uh, you know, micro-targeted online ads, uh, sales bots even now, right, that are going to influence people at the moment of financial decisions. And that's just going to outstrip the influence of financial education uh, on consumers. In terms of also uh, just, um, well, the massive inefficiency, of course, right, doing, doing this and, uh, as opposed to us each, you know, uh, being our own doctor, our own uh, auto mechanic, et cetera. Uh, we have experts for this um, and we have regulation to make sure things are safe. Um, now I do, I am overall sort of someone who believes we can do anything. Like we managed to put people on the moon. We can do anything, um, but we're just not going to do it. Um, and it, we wouldn't really want to. I mean, imagine that world. You'd have to be training people their whole lives, right? We'd make massive amounts of money and time on this. And we would end up having to take a fairly values-laden approach in teaching people which are the right habits and which are the right decisions um, that I don't think we really want to be taking. Um, so there's lots of other things we can do too, uh, you know, that are obviously got cheaper. We could just even improving neonatal care um, would make a big difference in people's brains and cognitive abilities that would do so much more. Well, we're going to come back to alternatives. Uh, I hadn't gone all the way to like neonatal care as an alternative financial education, but I like it. Um, uh, Rafe, you uh, are overseeing a consumer protection uh core of work at IPA. And there have been a couple of things that come out of that particularly caught my eye that I think may people not connect directly to financial uh, literacy education, but I think are pretty relevant. Um, could you tell us about some of the early work there in terms of uh, fraud and, and you know real world pricing of financial products? Mm -hmm. Yeah, so so on, on fraud, which I think is, um, you know, kind of one of the um, the most pernicious emerging risks that we face in digital financial services. Um, you know, the work we've done just um, just shows that it's it's going to be hard to make this a purely consumer side solution uh, to fraud prevention and mitigation. Um, for example, uh, you know, some researchers just recently did an audit of all the uh, fintech apps in the Google Play Store. Um, this is Jonathan Fu and Marino Mishra working with us out of the University of Zurich. And they developed an algorithm that had a pretty powerful ability to predict um, whether an app was likely to be fraudulent, a scam where they say, you can get a loan, but you need to pay the registration fee first. And there's never a loan at the end, right? It's just a way to, to harvest some rents. And so, in their model, about three quarters of the apps were likely fraudulent. And it can be hard to distinguish this um, because some of the things that, that their algorithm identified as 
likely to mean an app is fraudulent is a lot of positive reviews in a short period of time. And so a consumer is not really going to be able to parse through that easily and figure out, you know, is this a lot of positive reviews in a short time or is this a lot of positive reviews because it's actually a good service? And so there will, these kind of things, there's always going to be a need for regulators. Um, it's the same with, you know, if we want to go old school with, you know, these what we call briefcase SACOs or saving credit cooperatives in Africa that would show up and, and disappear. And having some ability for the government to monitor and to verify the legitimacy is way better than a consumer trying to figure out whether this SACO is legitimate or not. Um, and so I think there's a lot that financial literacy wants to put the burden on the consumer. And we just see the complexity makes it challenging on uh, things around fraud, but also more basic stuff around just knowing the cost of your services. So we did an audit recently in Nigeria of digital transactions. And um, we found that, you know, we were, we were basically doing, you know, sort of a mystery shopping style where you do a transaction um, and try and determine the price of it. And we even had people calling customer care of financial service providers. And um, in 38% of the of the cases, the information reported, um, the price information reported on the website or at the agent versus what customer care told was inconsistent. In 12% of the cases, we couldn't find any pricing information, whether from customer care or, or posted online or at the agent. So you can't even find out what the costs are. And so that's not a case for education, that's a case for regulation. Um, and even going deeper on this, there's, um, hidden things like ussd charges when you do a transaction on your phone and we found um in nigeria in 11 percent of the transactions the ussd charges exceeded the cap and for a consumer to figure that out you'd have to go in the back end and figure out what your airtime was your airtime balance was before you did this financial transaction then figure out if um, what it was afterwards and was it charged from that or was it because I was using data at the same time on an app and my data bundle was being depleted? I mean, basically that's not possible. And so this is the kind of thing where a regulator needs to step in and intervene. And so I think just what we, when we look at, you know, what is the level of incidence of harm and we look at the, um, the reasons for harm, a lot of times, I don't think it's something where we can always educate our way out of it. Um, it's where you need rules and you need data-driven supervision. So uh, Jashri, you know, Rafe sort of touches on a couple of things that there, there has been this bigger impetus towards financial literacy education, particularly because of digital mm -hmm. and the rate of change of things. And you know, some of this argument is it, it does feel a little strange to be saying, we shouldn't teach people the basics of the financial system and how to use their ATM cards and you know, how to use mobile money. So for instance, FAI, uh, Jonathan Mordock has a project uh, with co-authors in Bangladesh, encouraging migrants from rural Bangladesh to urban areas to use mobile money remittances to send money home. And it, has materially positive impacts on consumption back in these rural villages. And in some ways, that's a financial literacy intervention that you know, we, we conducted and we're championing and trying to expand it because it, it helps. So uh, you know, there, there is this, this question of, shouldn't we be doing something for people? How do you think about literacy and capability and these issues? And isn't there a need for something? I mean, there is, there is a need to be aware of the environment in which one operates. So, and I think the terms financial literacy, financial capability, digital financial capability, digital capability, everything is used interchangeably, which is a, which is a problem to start with. Um, the financial literacy, when, you know, when, when we think about it, it's, it's the awareness of concepts and having the skills to, you know, having skills to manage a budget. And, uh, you know, Jonathan Murdoch's work on portfolios of the poor tells you that the poor already have that skill. Uh, they do have the, and they have fairly complex money management skills. Um, so it's, it's, 
and capability is about attitudes and behavior. So, so it's in addition to the knowledge and skills, are you then able to make a financial decision which is suitable to your risk profile and social and financial circumstances? And that's when it starts getting a little bit more complicated because then it is, we're assuming that the consumer has the confidence to ask the right questions, has been able, you know, has has the ability to apply the concepts that they might have learned, has had the opportunity to apply it and remembers it at the point that they're making a decision. Um, and, you know, is is uh, at the end of the day, it makes it seem as though the onus lies on the consumer. And then we forget that with financial capability, there's there's a whole bunch of normative issues. So, you know, does the consumer even have the agency to make the decision at that point in time? Uh, so, you know, are, are we talking about, so if, you know, if, if with financial capability, some of the initiatives that have been designed is women that use mobile phones get get calls from, from an IVR or a mobile number. Now, if you live in, in an environment where getting a call from a strange number, an unidentified number, is going to you know raise all kinds of suspicions in your community or in your household, um, risking even you know access to the mobile itself. Um, how well does that work? So it's some of this also lies. Some of the financial capability responsibility has to lie with providers and policymakers. And then we're laying on you know digital literacy, which is are you 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 might have a mobile phone, you might be using WhatsApp. Do you really know what information to share? Um, you know, and is if you do share information that is private, is the onus of doing that going to lie entirely on you? Do you know who to trust? Um, and then digital financial capability is a whole new level of complexity, which is the ability to access, manage, understand, evaluate financial services, and then use it in a digital environment in a way where you're protecting yourself. That's a lot to lay on a customer. Mm -hmm. So I want to encourage everyone to use uh, Q&A uh, if you have sort of questions you want to add, and we'll be try and bring those into the conversation. Uh, um, we, there is uh, uh, one question there and some question of um, anonymity. So I will say if you do prefer to keep your question private, you can uh, use a chat to the panelists directly. Um, the Q&A uh, process, I think, is transparent to everybody on the call, so if that's a concern. But Laura, I want to come back to you because you know you said there's no evidence, solid evidence, that financial literacy education makes a difference and changes what people do. And you and I have been back and forth on this, but there is a uh, a famous meta analysis from I think 2014 that finds that essentially no behavior change is a uh, outcome of financial uh, literacy education. But there's a new paper by Anna Maria Lusardi and co-authors, uh, a meta-analysis that uh, looks back at that work, reanalyzes it, adds in a whole bunch of more papers, focuses on randomized control trials, which you know, if you're if you hang around in my circles, you know, like randomized control trials, we trust a whole lot more than most of the research that's out there for very good reasons. Um, and they find that, in fact, I think the title of it is "Financial Literacy Changes Behaviors." Um, you and I have had some back and forth on this, looking at this. Uh, we've sort of both written something a, a, about it, but I want to ask you, why don't you believe that meta-analysis? Um, so it's it's by Kaiser, Lusardi, Mankoff, and Urban, just to give everyone credit. Um, and um, I analyzed it actually before it had become published. I don't believe there's a lot of changes in um, the, the version that's been published. Um, and it's really is an improvement in many ways on prior studies uh, in that they looked at a larger number of studies, looked at 76 randomized experiments. Uh, and they do have some, I think, uh, useful uh, critiques of the 2014 study. Um, but the, um, they studied such a great variety of interventions that it doesn't really tell us anything about any one intervention. Um, they, they included all these different studies. Some of the things they included, quite honestly, I don't think you can even categorize as financial literacy interventions, you know, training business managers in accounting, inventory management, and marketing, um, you know, studies of nudges, 
uh, studies of um, savings match programs. Um, there are some interesting programs that have some, some interesting potential that are not financial literacy education, like creating intentional peer pressure groups, uh, which is what one study did, or um, patients training, uh, which would be really cool if that actually worked. It would be amazing for lots of things. Um, but even if we put those aside, um, you know, uh, just look at those studies that are plausibly characterized as financial literacy education. Um, there was such a tremendous variety in treatments, populations, and outcome measures that it, you really can't draw any useful conclusions. Um, so just to sort of show what I mean, one of the studies looked at the effects of a, an educational soap opera and found that it increased a debt counseling helpline's call volume when that debt counseling hotline had its number right at the end of the soap opera. Another study that's included in the meta-analysis reported null effect of an online program on respondent self-assessed likelihood of opening um, a retirement account. And another found a negative effect of an, a lengthy high school curriculum. Um, respondents self-reported more use of high cost credit uh, if they uh, were in the program and more late payments uh, if they uh, had taken the program. Now, what can we get conclude about financial <laughs> literacy education based on these three things? I don't think we can include anything. I mean, it's like, you can't put a study of bloodletting and a study of you know, heart surgery together and decide whether medical treatments are effective or not effective. Um, it's just, just doesn't tell us anything. Um, there's a bunch of other issues with the, with the underlying studies too, once you start looking at them. I mean, um, they only found effects for savings and budgeting. They didn't find any effects for, uh, on credit use, insurance or remittances. Every study of budgeting behavior is self-reported. We know there's a demand bias problem. Uh, and even <laughs> the savings uh, uh, studies um, that showed some effects, um, most of them only use self-assessed savings. So some of the programs based it on questions like, how often do you save? How good at you are you at saving? And then decided based on that, whether the program was effective. Um, some asked people questions like about attitude. Is it, is it good to save money? Um, or uh, hypotheticals, if you found $500 on the street, what would you do with it? So I don't think those are terribly uh, helpful. Only seven of the 76 studies were actually able to verify some uh, savings from administrative records. Uh, at least two of those found no positive effects of their interventions, uh, education interventions on savings. Some found positive effects of other things like nudges and that sort of thing. Um, there was some positive uh, effects that are plausible, I think, on not just um, confidence, self-assessed knowledge, um, but also on actual knowledge in the short term. Uh, but that is dwarfed by the effects on overconfidence, essentially, mm -hmm. creating too much confidence. Um, so uh, although I do think that it was an ambitious study that tried to correct some of the issues, in prior studies, uh, it just was, it's not um, a question given the variety of interventions that really works uh, for a meta study where a meta study can really be, a meta analysis can really be helpful. Thanks. Um, and you know, for me, really key is this question about um, administrative data versus self reports um, because you know, what, what I see when I look at so many of these papers is if you intensively try to teach people that the right answer to a question is, should I save or should I borrow? The answer is save. You can get people to answer save. But when we look at well-constructed studies of actual behavior where we can verify that it's not just self-reports, we hardly ever see material changes uh, in people's behavior. Now, th that's totally understandable because most of the people at financial education is directed at are people on low incomes <laughs> and do you know uh, a program to browbeat lower income people to say you should spend less 
you there I think there should be real ethical issues on some of that of like why are we telling people who are having trouble making ends meet that they're doing stuff wrong and they should be saving money and the reason they're poor is they don't save enough um you know we've talked some about attitudes like in the long term I just it it baffles me that we think telling people in low income circumstances that their problems are their fault is the best way to help them uh, you know, have a locus of control and a sense of like, I can do stuff in the world. But uh, Jashri, so there's this other thread in what Lauren's talking about, which is how do we even think about what people should know and be able to do? Um, what does really count um, as financial literacy, financial capability, financial confidence, control, you know, you've you know, looked at a lot of capability things from a lot of different contexts, from IFMR and Devara to CFI, Acción, you know, lots of CGAP, lots of places. This is one of the really troubling questions to me is it's not a throw up our hands and say, well, nobody can do anything. Um, but also what should we really be thinking about as most important um, in equipping low income households to be a better part, to, to, to to survive the financial system. When you think about, okay, how do I make a difference? Like, what do we need to do in financial capability? What, what falls in your sort of bucket of things we should be paying attention to? So a, a couple of things actually, and um, I, I just answered a question that somebody had asked about a uh, point of sale, uh, you know, and if, if training is provided at the point of sale and that translates into better uptake, is that good financial education? It can be. But provided you, you know, regulation allows you to, um, allows the consumer to go back on her choice if she feels that that's not a great product that she's taken in the first place. And that's possible with products like insurance. It's possible with long-term savings. It's less likely with credit because, you know, you then started utilizing the money. Um, so, so strong regulations that allow you to go back on your decision and, you know, recognize that that's that's human is one uh trust plays a big role um and peer networks uh, we found you know can help with that so when particularly when you're catering to um to to women that that have a, a set of questions but feel uncomfortable asking the financial service provider or feel uncomfortable asking somebody that is is a stranger um having a having a network of people that they can then rely on uh, which could be part of the community that that helps um what else could help i mean with capability we've seen a number of initiatives uh which help at that point in time it's still unclear how much of that impact you know lasts over an extended period of time and and i think that is something that we need to recognize um but having Providing the ability to ask the right questions or providing, um, you know, strong, providing the comfort that there is redress that's possible if you feel you've made a mistake or you can backtrack. I think those are important building blocks to make sure that, you know, that financial education works. Oh, Rafe, in this question that we, we had and, and um, Jayashree, uh sort of answered some questions there's also been some trials of a variety of uh point of attack shall we say um interventions that i think of i think of uh javi Gine and co-authors sort of changing what information is available at the point of making a loan decision um i think of uh Horacio atanasio and, and co-authors in colombia and the you know teaching people to use atms i think of um, Erica Field and Rohini Pandey, some work in, in India on uh, opening uh, bank accounts for direct deposit for women and teaching them how to use kiosks. So when you sort of think about actually effective interventions, is there some themes emerging there that you've seen in you know, IPA related work on where, where are, uh, where can we intervene? What are channels for intervention that, that are useful? Yeah, so I think that um, it'll start with when I look at um, like what do I, where do I think 
we're kind of we're not going to be able to improve through education or consumer empowerment. And I think it's pretty clear on issues where there's a conflict of interest there's um, of the sales person. So in my own personal work and some work that was also done in India, but some work we did in, in Mexico with Javi Gine, where uh, we found that um, you know, the government had these mandated no frill, low cost, basic savings accounts. And we found that even when consumers had the profile that absolutely fit um, the accounts, we scripted them to articulate a need case and a deposit amount that would make it yes, give them a basic savings account. They were never given that account. In India, the researchers went a step further and had them specifically ask for it by name. And the sales staff gave fictitious reasons, um, like requirements that didn't exist around ID, why they couldn't give them these. And you've seen that with um, financial advice, like um, Internet Shar and Sendel Molinathan's uh, work around financial advisors in the U.S. or um, what Santosh Anago looked at with, um, you know, with term life insurance or some insurance work I did in, in, in Malaysia. So basically, I think it's that is a case that financial literacy likes to talk a lot about, but that will, we will never be able to resolve that through education because there's such an information asymmetry and there's a power dynamic in those interactions. Um, where I where I am more optimistic are where you can you can provide some neutral information or intervention at the at a point of decision making um, when the decision making is not overly influenced by another individual. And so we've done done work, um, you know, testing different ways to disclose the cost of loans instead of disclosing in percentage term, disclosing an actual monetary value, and have seen through some lab testing and some live testing that it improves consumers' ability to pick the lower cost of loan options. And so that's that's not getting to the issue of um, you know whether consumers should be taking on this debt in the first place, but at least it's showing a way to direct them to the less expensive of the products if they're if they're going to um, take those those on. Um, I also there's some interesting stuff around with, with what digital makes possible. So I'm thinking about Alfredo Berlando, Silvia Prina and Michael Kuhn recently did a experiment with a lender where they just delayed the disbursement of these instant consumer loans by a few hours and it reduced default rates in that sample. And this was randomized. And so that to me is a really interesting intervention that because some people borrow for less than optimal reasons, and um, you know, maybe having a little bit of time to cool off, as Jay Shree mentioned, uh, and think about it can be beneficial. But the the thing is, when you think about all those, honestly, that's not really financial literacy. That's consumer protection regulation, which is what I mainly work on. And you know, I would absolutely put the cost of those projects and those reforms against the cost of financial literacy programs that seek to have the same effect. And I am pretty sure I'm gonna win every time. It's so much less costly to do effective um, product regulation and supervision. Um, and just, um, and so maybe this is not a, a, the same point, but it's one I wanna make while I'm here, now that I'm talking about the regulation, is that, what is really frustrating for me with the sort of financial literacy evangelists is they are harming consumer protection, particularly in jurisdictions where you have limited resources for market conduct in a central bank. So I have many times walked into a meeting with a brand new central bank consumer protection unit and there's four or five staff responsible for the entire country, right? This is not the CFPB. This is bare bones, and three of them are on financial literacy, right? And doing financial education programs with no impact evaluation in place. And we don't even have basic, you know, product transparency regulations in, in place at that point. We don't have supervision manuals for market conduct. And when, you know, and this is when, you know, people, academics and those who are development funders aggressively push financial literacy in these situations, you are pushing out 
the bandwidth for consumer protection because these small teams cannot do both effectively. And it's much more effective, in my opinion, to start with the consumer protection work. And so that's, I would say that's my main frustration and it's a lived frustration. And so you're literally, you are causing harm to consumer protection in these markets when you do this. And so I wish they would stop. So I just needed to make that point. I, well, great. I'm, I'm glad you made it. It's, um, we do have some questions coming in. I want to reassure everybody, if we don't get to the question live, we always do a follow-up post with the questions that we didn't get to and responses from panelists. So don't feel like you shouldn't answer a question, even if you don't think we're going to get to it. We'd love to see those questions and have a chance to respond to them. Um, but but Lauren, you know, coming back to you, um, I am always sort of on a, a hobby horse about helping the rest of the world learn from the United States because we've made a lot of mistakes in the development of our the financial system here. And there's a lot to learn, both sort of positively and how to avoid some mistakes. And you know, Rafe is pointing to this trade-off between literacy and consumer protection. And you referenced this earlier, this idea somehow that the financial realm is an area where people should be responsible for their own decisions, where in many other highly consequential decisions, like it would be ridiculous to say the problem with uh, the prevalence of heart attacks is we haven't taught enough people to be cardiologists and they should all be able to diagnose themselves with all of these sorts of things. Now, it doesn't mean we don't like put uh, you know, whatever they're called, the, the CPR machines in more and more places because they save lives and there's some basic education. But we didn't say like everybody should resp be responsible for self admit Why is it that we seem to think that in this space, regulators should do less? And we don't make that argument of, yeah, it's people should diagnose their toasters to make sure they don't explode. Um, well, I think it's partly just a political economy issue, right? I mean, debt collectors, they only make money if people cannot afford their debts, they support financial literacy education, right? Um, and, you know, they support it for the same reasons that pursuing it actually causes harm. Um, opportunity costs, gives re regulators an excuse not to regulate effectively. Um, and this culture of consumer responsibility, um, you know, part of it is um, even deep seated in some sort of puritanical instincts and that kind of thing um, that probably aren't really applicable today's, to today's world and to what's actually going on. Um, but, you know, we blame consumers when what happened was simply due to a structural issues, right? Like unpredictable income and expense shocks. Well, guess what? Regulators, academics cannot tell you how to budget when your income and expenses are unpredictable and you don't have enough slack in your budget to weather storms, right? I mean, there, there's just not a way um, to, uh, to do that. And so regulators can't do it either, can't figure out what to do. Um, the responsibilizing, though, really only apply, applies one way in the US. You know, financial firms are not required to act responsibly. They're not required to communicate with consumers in timely and understandable ways um, with complete and accurate information about costs and benefits. They have no duty in the US to avoid foreseeable harm. They can sell a consumer product they know will cause harm. They don't have even a general obligation to act in good faith. They can use spurious, gratuitous complexity to confuse consumers. Um, and here is where I might suggest we uh, look beyond the US. Um, so in 2015, I proposed a new paradigm for regulating um, consumer transactions, not just financial, but um, <clears throat> it's been picked up mostly in the financial sector. I called it performance-based consumer law, but others are calling it outcomes-based uh, regulation. And the idea is to give businesses more responsibility and more flexibility to meet those responsibilities so that firms are held responsible for designing, marketing, and selling products and services that foreseeably 
will create good outcomes for consumers, right? It's not requiring them to be insurers. Uh, you know, unforeseeable events happen. But products and services have to be designed to try to create good outcomes for consumers and sold and marketed in a way that it reaches the correct target outcome, target market. But then at the same time, to give firms more flexibility, right? Currently, we tell them how they have to structure products, and we require these reams of disclosures that aren't terribly helpful. Um, and instead, we should allow them, like, maybe instead of this paper disclosure, a little video would be more effective, right, at communicating information. Let them do that. So I proposed it in 2015. It's been taken up by Australia, um, by ASIC, in what's called the design and distribution obligations. And in the UK, uh, it'll be finalized in July of this year. A similar approach um, called the consumer duty, uh, which places a duty on firms to act uh, to deliver good outcomes for consumers. And I think this will be a revolutionary uh, type of regulation. It will require firms uh, to think about the end point and then work backwards to how to get there. Um, and it will also future-proof uh, consumer financial regulation uh, because we don't have to keep changing what the disclosure is uh, or uh, that kind of thing. Um, and uh, so I think that it's very promising uh, and we should look uh, to these other countries and their adoption of sort of this more um, uh, regulation that really gets to what we want instead of these intermediate uh, disclosure and product design rules. Can I, can I jump in and ask Lauren Please. a follow-up question? Yeah. So Lauren, how would this work in a scenario where, uh, or in a country where you have uh, product specific regulators? How would it work? Um, you know, and I'm particularly thinking of India where I did quite a bit of work and you have an insurance regulator, you have a capital markets regulator and you have, you know, the, the Reserve Bank of India that regulates banks and other financial institutions. Well, I think it, it works perfectly well there. Obviously there's no, um, people live their financial lives in connection with a bunch of different providers anyhow, right? But if an insurance policy had to be designed to meet the objection, uh, objectives, financial situation and needs of the customer. And then the marketing had to be designed to get that insurance product to the customers for whom it's appropriate. Uh, that's great. And the insurance regulator in some ways, you know, can really focus on managing to do that within uh, insurance. You're gonna have some issues where products cross lines, but you already have that, right? Um, and so uh, I, I don't think there's really any, any issue there um, in the investments area, you know, that also uh, the investments uh, regulators can, can work on um, and that uh, in their area, uh, et cetera, et cetera. And do you, I mean, so the outcomes would be then held in some kind of a centralized repository because you, you know, the interactions of these products would still be at the household level. Yeah, yes. Um, so one is just what, what is the reasonably foreseeable outcome of this for this consumer target market, this consumer mm -hmm. profile. And then firms are also required to uh, continually check to see how the consumer is being affected by the product. So it is at the product level. It doesn't capture whole um, household uh, effects. But if every product provider were trying to produce good outcomes, were um, avoiding even foreseeable harm, if that's all they did was try to do no harm, that would be a tremendous improvement. Mm. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot happening in the chat and the Q&A, which I'm very grateful for. I want to draw in a couple of threads here just generally, which is you're trying to find this sweet spot of um, there are a lot of policymakers and practitioners who really are anchored on financial literacy. Um, how do we move those people off? But in a related way, this issue of there is some element of teaching people their rights and teaching people some basic understanding. So, uh, you know, Tim Nurse, uh, uh, a longtime 
friend, you know, points out that we do actually do try to teach people some basic nutrition and health information. It's not like we don't try to teach people sort of basics of some things on some basic sanitation and health things. And that we do think people need to be educated about lowering the risk of cardiac disease and stroke. Or um, we also really think it's important that people can read. Um, and we, you know, we're, you know, this is an argument that like school doesn't work. We shouldn't teach people stuff. Um, so how do we sort of land in a place where there is some set of intervention, some set of end education, some set of empowerment to consumers that doesn't, as Rafe says, undermine consumer protection, equips people with some sense of how the world should work, um, even level of how to recognize a scam. Um, you know, I don't think we can do that perfectly, but there are some basic things. Like I get discouraged these days a lot when I read some of these stories of the people who are falling for scams. They, like, uh, there's a story that yesterday that uh, Facebook, Google, Apple, Amazon, all have been regularly falling for scam requests from fake uh, law enforcement agencies looking for account data on, you know, faking that they're um, someone of imminent harm, we need to get access to their account so we can find them so they don't commit suicide. And they're turning over this information to people regularly who then use it in predatory ways. And then people get, like if Facebook can't figure out whether a legal office is real, right? At the same time, like there are some patterns that people need to be able to recognize to know that at Rafe, as you give the example, if somebody says you have to pay an application fee and they've got only five-star reviews, that's probably not real. So where do we end up with something that gives people something to do and not throw up their hands? Like there are a lot of people in the world who want to help. And I feel like they end up in financial education support because they don't know what else to do. And it feels like, hey, this is, this is something we can do. Um, Jayashree, you know, I, I don't, I hate to put you really on the spot here. Like this is sort of out of the blue, but like, what should we be, you know, what can we do, do you think, now? Um, how can we get people anchored on things that matter and are more likely to produce positive outcomes for people? Gosh, you did really put me on the spot because I was responding to a question on this. <laughs> um, I mean, we... I don't think we're thinking of outcomes. I think most financial uh, literacy campaigns, uh, you know, are what somebody had in the comments said is, is, you know, ends up being a checkbox compliance. So you feel good about yourself for having done that. So if, you know, the first thing that we need to then agree on as an industry is, you know, what is the good outcome that we want to achieve? And uh, not all outcomes will, will be, quantitatively measurable so you know it's, it's quite hard to 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 demonstrate that but um, but you know are we making some kind of progress towards doing no harm towards making sure that suitable products are delivered and I'm talking in the language of consumer protection because that is essentially what what financial education is supposed to achieve in a sense uh, you know are, are we creating an environment where people can act? in a way that you know that they're confident they are not going to be hurt i don't know if i answered your question though i, I mean i don't think this is an easy question to answer i wasn't looking for like here's our three bullet point plan to fix the problem because this is a really tough problem it's not as if it's just a, a quick thing it, rafe yeah. something you'd like to add there i will point out rafe is doing yeoman's work answering questions in the chat and in the q a he's not just sort of distracted paying attention to something else he's really paying attention and i really appreciate him uh sort of taking action there on things we're not going to get to live but yeah to that end can you refresh the question <laughs> because i was answering all the questions so how do we get people anchored on you know people who really want to do the right thing yeah and are really committed to financial education because it feels like at least it's something that i can do how yeah, do we yeah. shift those people onto something that might be a little better in terms of generating outcomes? I think you have to show them. So we've, I was typing one of the answers earlier, some of the best examples we've had is when we work hand in hand with a regulator and actually bring new data. Um, like I remember I was 
I was, um, you know, pitching something around uh, pricing transparency reforms once to the head of a government agency. And he said, I get, I get the principle, but show me that it matters. And so then we were lucky there was a natural experiment where there was a major change in mobile money tariffs. And we showed how people were anchored to the prior tariffs. We showed how people were miscalculating different fees. And then with that data, they issued a, um, a new comprehensive first of its kind pricing transparency rules for that digital finance market. Um, and we did some follow-up, some, um, it's not an RCT, but some, some surveys of a sample and saw improvements in their ability to know the cost of their transactions after the reform happened. So that was not super expensive or complicated. And it, it was the evidence that got them to not just think about let's do an education program that got them to get towards what's a transparency reform. Um, similarly, the work with Xavi in Mexico and other markets um, with the lab testing and disclosure formats. Um, I think when you can have a regular sit down and see consumers totally misinterpret market information, it um, it shows them that maybe you know consumers can't really learn to be experts if the information is bad to begin with. So it's really these hand in hand, simple, you know, iterative um, research gathering and experimentation, not just RCTs, um, that can convert uh, in particular policymakers on this. Um, I think also maybe some positive framing. A few people made a good point of being overly simplistic, perhaps that like, what about education around consumer rights? And I 100% believe in that. Education around awareness of an ombud or awareness of your right to redress or what to do if a provider doesn't resolve your complaint is pretty specific. You can embed that in product delivery or product enrollment and other things. You can do periodic reminders that can be effective. And so there may be ways where we can say this is technically, you know, financial education of a kind, but it's a rights-based curriculum. It's not the compounding interest stuff that we know doesn't work. Lauren, I saw you um, nodding your head too there. It uh, looked like you were about to leap in as well. Um, I just think taking um, a more holistic approach to um, how is it we can create a marketplace that we could teach consumers to operate it, right? And what, what are the skills, what are the things that consumers need? And you'll often find that they're so much cheaper as well, right? So I mentioned before, you know, um, in your utero and early life conditions, those interventions are pennies on the dollar um, with their effects, right? They improve numeracy, patience, executive function. If people have better nutrition, less pollution, and less alcohol exposure when they are in utero. Huge, huge. Um, even physical health uh, for adults helps with self-control and cognitive ability. Um, reducing acute stress caused by income volatility uh, and scarcity effects, right? That in all impair every kind of decision, not just financial. Um, and, uh, you know, right now people are operating in a world that is awash in deception, discrimination, and anti-competitive conduct. And all of these things, they lower wages, they increase prices, they make it harder to function. We need to increase law enforcement on the extensive and intensive margin. I mean, think about the Wells Fargo scandal. It took over 5,000 employees creating 1.5 million fake accounts before government regulators did anything. Think about the, the penalties that are given. I mean, PayPal engaged in this um, scheme, according to the CFPB, that was extremely fraudulent. They made um, you know, millions and millions of dollars on it. They received a slap on the wrist. They paid 0.002% of their profits as their penalties. That's nothing for them. And so when you have a system that is just rife with these problems, it's impossible to train, train people to act within it. I mean, like the disclosure in the lab, that's one thing, but people, there's no, no requirement for people not to run circles around it when it hits the field. Mm -hmm. And so we have to enforce uh, these regulations. We have to think about just basic human abilities that can be a lot cheaper and can therefore be attractive if people are thinking about the long run. 
Um, and, you know, we want people to be able to plan uh, financially. That's incredibly important is financial planning. But you can't be able to plan if you don't have, um, you know, basic income enough to cover your basic expenses. Um, and you need, um, you know, transaction accounts that are cheap, uh, you know, payment devices, insurance, emergency credit, those kind of basic low cost uh, things that many other countries are doing, actually, mm -hmm. um, perhaps not as effectively as I hoped, as according to what Rafe was saying about some of these. Um, but um, but we need to do that to enable consumers to then put to use these things that we're trying uh, to teach them. Um. As always, I want to keep talking for another half hour behind our scheduled time. You know, we can see some of or we're losing some of our attendees because we schedule this for for an hour and we there's just so many threads here. Uh, I'm so glad we started this conversation. I'm hopeful that maybe this turns into a further conversation because there is a whole lot of um, need for more discussion of practical alternatives to make progress here and not just sort of admitting defeat. Um, but I want to wrap up with just sort of a general thought here um, and just comment. We are going to uh, provide a summary. We're going to go back to the Q&A. Panelists will sort of uh, provide answers offline to some of the comments and questions that we've gotten. But, you know, I, I, I labeled this, you know, in the title, it's a trap, um, which is, you know, just the general uh, Star Wars reference. But also, you know, part of how I think about our challenge here is what I call the Star Wars fallacy. And the Star Wars fallacy is if you look at all the Star Wars movies, they've got this incredible technology and almost always they have human beings shooting the guns. Human beings who don't seem to be able to hit something moving in a constant line at a constant velocity. And it's just baffling um, if you take a step back, like why do they expect human beings to be able to do this stuff? And particularly as digital transforms, the providers, uh, Lauren, you made this reference right at the beginning, have so much better information and so much more ability. We already have good research showing that many uh, loan providers target loans based on highly detailed information about the behavioral biases of individual customers. And expecting customers to be able to figure that out, uh, there's just such a huge asymmetry in power and knowledge and capability that we're not gonna fix by teaching people basic concepts of uh, numeracy. Not that numeracy isn't important, but you know, just because you can even com calculate compound interest does not save you from a bank who has highly detailed information about your online behavior, figuring out how to micro-target an offer to you that's gonna be highly profitable for them and suboptimal for you. And so we need to be really thinking here about taking next steps that don't ignore the consumer and their ability to make choices, but recognize, uh, as in so many other things, there's a massive asymmetry of power and information, and we're not going to fix that through education. So I'd like to hope that sometime over the course of the next year, maybe we can all get together again in person, possibly, and really focus on how do we start closing those gaps realistically in the United States, in other uh, wealthier countries, in developing countries that uh, realistically take into account the disadvantages or the challenges that regulators have uh, across the board. They have to keep up with this stuff too, and it's really hard to do. So um, I'm gonna sort of wrap that up. Um, thank everybody for being, uh, for joining us for this time. Really, really appreciate Lauren, Rafe, and, and Jaishree joining us for these thoughts. Um, as I mentioned, I'll be following up with you to ask some more questions. Um, and for any of our attendees, if you have ideas that we need to share with the world, please do forward those on. I think there's a lot more to be said here and we'll look forward to being a part of that in collaboration uh, with other people attending, with Lauren, with Rafe, with Jaishree, with CFI, with IPA, uh, with AFI and other regulators around the world. So thank you for joining us for this version of the Five Live. Uh, stay tuned, there'll be more to come and we'll look forward to having lots more discussions about this. Thank you, Lauren. Thank you, Rafe. Thank you, Jaishree. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.